Matt Williams is the curator of the public program at Camden Arts Center. Um, he was the former head of program at ICA London and creative director at the International Project Space Birmingham um, City University. Matt has curated numerous monographic and group exhibitions as well as public programs, both nationally and internationally, cultivating a distinctive portfolio of cultural initiatives and interdisciplinary projects. These projects often exist at the nexus of art and society and routinely involve collaboration with creative practitioners, academics, publishers, and independent grassroots organizations. And with that, um, I'll just say for um, everyone in the audience, Matt will speak for about 50 minutes. And then um, at the bottom of your screen, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you could do so in the Q&A. Uh, so Matt, over to you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to start off by going through um, three projects that I'm going to talk through. And I've got lots of arms and legs. Um, but the first uh, project I'm going to talk through is a recent uh, research project that I've just completed as part of um, a kind of academic study. And that is, this first slide um, is an image of Cox Street in Coventry. And the title of the project is called We Versions. And the question is, how can a curatorial toolkit for sand art excavate historical sites of cultural resistance? So I'm going to begin by um, basically talking about why the name We Versions and why and how this research came about and what the ambitions are for it going forward. So the name We Versions comes from, so we comes from the idea of the collective voice or public formed through shared experiences or interests. And versions comes from the method of versioning, which is prevalent in dub music, which challenges musical and cultural boundaries and is a representative of a form of deconstruction that questions notions of originality or ownership in music that mirror that mirror broader cultural and political attitudes particularly within marginalized communities so my ambition for this research project is to try and kind of develop an agency of sorts but it's still very much in a kind of embryonic formative stage but what that agency was aimed to do is to be a curatorial research and productive uh, production initiative that creates public sound works to foster civic engagement. It also seeks to excavate the collective voices and cultural activities of communities by sonically mapping their spatial environments and historical context. Um, it will also seek to uncover new vocabularies and critical insights into the environments we inhabit and traverse to challenge established narratives and cultivate novel, explorative, auditory experiences. We Versions connects the past with the present and the future and emphasizes active listening and inclusivity to amplify voices previously unheard in mainstream discourses and ensure that it's accessible to all. So, yeah, so basically uh, this research just developed a curatorial toolkit, which prompts the question of what is a curatorial toolkit? So it the curatorial toolkit that I've devised draws on the experience as an interdisciplinary curator, collaborating with artists, managing artists from spaces, working commercial and university galleries, as well as mainstream public institutions. The toolkit also integrates elements from architecture, design, exhibition making, public art, social practice, and sound art, including commissioning, commissioning strategies and terminologies. It provides a variety of university described tools for adaptation to specific commissioning or project conditions. So rather than be operating like a prescriptive manual, it's designed to enhance curatorial practice serving as a roadmap for practitioners. Basically, you know, um, offering you fundamental guidance on timeframes, contracts, and in deliveries, and also just kind of uh, exchange with, you know, the stakeholders who are involved with the project. So, it does also prompt the question of what is sound art. So sound art, I interpret, is a discipline where sound serves as the main medium, often intersecting with music, visual arts, and performance. 
It also prompts the question, why did I employ sound as a primary medium in this research project, having worked you know, predominantly within uh, visual arts context? So the reason why I chose sound in this research is motivated by its viral democratic nature. It's uncontainable and sensory, and it's capable of evoking personal or collective memories and forging communal spaces. Sound uh, or specific sounds carry unique frequencies, which are often tied to certain places and materials and contribute to the distinctiveness of a location. Sound also importantly facilitates knowledge exchange. And then, so what are cult sites of cultural resistance? Well, for this, uh, I'm gonna refer to Stuart Hall as cultural sites of cultural resistance are complex. And Stuart Hall um, in his cultural studies theory highlights cultural power as being distinctive. Hall views cultural resistance as individuals or groups using culture to challenge mainstream societal norms. Cultural identities, he also identifies that cultural identities have histories and origins. They're not static, instead shaped by the interplay of history, culture, and power structures. Cultural resistance is also expressed not just in art, music, fashion, and graffiti, but it also is uh, has an ideological opposition to established norms. So here uh, I present to you basically what the, uh, the starting point for the exhibition. And on the left-hand side there, there's an aerial photo map from the 1970s of, um, of Coventry and the reconstruction of it. So basically Coventry experienced severe bombing in World War II, leading to a major rebuilding uh, program that was initially led by Donald Gibson. Uh, as, you know, many different kind of modernist kind of projects, it was utopian in its ideals and, it wanted to kind of basically offer a kind of social space uh, for its occupants and its constituents. It also uh, basically the focus of the reconstruction was on the city centre, which was encircled by a ring road, which was built um, to be a kind of logistical kind of channel. And this meant that it disrupted the medieval layout and displaced a number of different communities. So my research, um, and yeah, sorry, of course, it generated peripheral and neglected spaces, for example, hillfields, uh, which lacked infrastructure resulting in socioeconomic deprivation. So my research focuses on this one street here. I'll just put the, um, where the three spots are. And the first, the red spot, is a case study around a poetry festival that was organized by the Indian Workers Association in 1978 the Sydney Stringer School for Centre for School and Community Use. And then the second dot is just again, just on the outskirts of the Ring Road here, was for um, basically a sonic fiction around the, the first night all, the first legal all night inner city rave club, which was called The Eclipse. And that was again on Cox Street. And then the third dot here is the site of an active listening workshop that I did, but also it was the site where the um, conceptual art collective, art and language, were formed. And the reason why I chose this street um, is for you know a number of different reasons, really. But here you have the the website that I constructed to go alongside the project. But the Cox Street exemplified the challenges faced by, I guess, marginalized groups um, in Coventry at the time, um, because basically the key facet of it was trying to kind of uh, reposition um, these kind of historical narratives uh, regarding kind of sites of cultural resistance outside of mainstream um, cultural centers. So the idea was to actually take a site and to uh, basically kind of excavate and amplify these kind of historical actions. And the first one here on the left-hand side was This Voice Was Once Spoken, which was a uh, sound work by Paul Purgus, and that was focused on the aforementioned um, Indian Workers Association who held at Sydney Street School a poetry festival. And the, um, and what, you know, Basically, what's important about the Indian Workers Association was that they were formed in commentary and that they were kind of, um, they evolved in response to the mass migration post-war 
of um, workers from the Commonwealth and the British Isles that were necess necessitated when Coventry was rebuilt. So um, basically, this was something that, you know, basically changed the landscape of Coventry and the area that, if I go back to the PowerPoint, here was in the actual Hillfields area. And this school was built basically, um, City Street Centre was built with the funds of the Community Development uh, Programme. And that fund, the funds there were kind of um, initiated by the government at the time and were promoting cultural inclusivity. Basically, uh, a number of cities post war in the UK, um, certain kind of areas were kind of affected um, extremely by socioeconomic different challenges because, you know, through the deindustrialization or for, through kind of extensive rebuilding. So, you know, Perks's essay, um, This Voice Was Once Spoken, which I'll go back to now. Here you go. Basically is a audio essay that's drawn from a number of different um, kind of sonic art artifacts that were kind of developed through an extensive research process, which were then kind of housed in data sets, um, which were then formed by myself. And these data sets, you know, um, encompassed kind of original reel-to-reel -reel recordings, um, which were then transposed, media broadcasts, and uh, various interviews, excerpts from interviews with um, stakeholders that were kind of that's still alive today, that were involved. And the you know what's interesting about this project is that it um, it kind of draws upon the cyclical nature of the politics that are inherent within, I guess, UK culture about you know the um, uh, the angst or the kind of anxieties around immigration policies both then and today. So this was kind of an important kind of facet of that uh, that sound piece, which for those of you that want to listen to it, then if you go to weversions.site, you can listen to it then. So the second case study um, is Dismantling the Hardcore Continuum, Future of McDub. And this uh, was developed um, with um, a writer and musician, um, an artist called DeForest Brown Jr. And DeForest is, uh, presents himself as an ex-American um, and as a rhythm analysis and writer. And recent outputs by DeForest, uh, besides his music practice, is this kind of brilliant book that he wrote called Assembling a Black Counterculture, which very much looks at the kind of the history, uh, the history of Detroit and Detroit techno in relation to the economic, the kind of uh, mass migration and the kind of deindustrialization of that as a city, which drew immediate parallels for me with Coventry, which um, was for an extensive period during my youth, which is hence the reason why I chose Coventry, where I grew up, was um, one of the, uh, it was kind of had the highest unemployment in the UK for a period of eight years. And that kind of generated a number of different problems within the city. But what it also did, um, you know, which are then kind of signaled within the Paul Perkins piece, but what it also did um, was create a number of empty buildings or peripheral spaces. And within these spaces that were kind of perceived as undesirable, um, you could actually get them for very cheap rents. And it made um, it possible for, I guess, countercultural or counter publics to kind of inhabit these spaces. And the Eclipse was one of these spaces. So the Eclipse was basically formerly, um, it was originally a pub called Sydney Palace, then it was knocked down. And then it was turned into a bingo centre, a cinema. And then just prior to um, it opening as the Eclipse, it was nearly a, uh, it was nearly a church, nearly converted into a church. So this site that kind of sat directly below the ring road um, was quite pivotal to me as a youth because I went there when I was 15. And it was, I guess, the first time that I actually encountered 
um, something that I you know refer to in my research as a wild space, a kind of space that kind of is uh, has its own set of kind of rules or behaviours. And within that, you know, the, the space I, you know, I listen to, you know, formative forms of dance music, UK dance music. So originally, um, music had always kind of Balearic or kind of North American, and this kind of new sound uh, started to emerge within the UK, which also coincided with the kind of um, the emergence of new technologies. And the theorist, um, Simon Reynolds refers to that as the hardcore continuum. And the hardcore continuum, he uh, posits, is something that kind of runs from its kind of evolution in the early 90s, late well, late 80s, early 90s. And it's still prevalent today and it's still kind of evidenced in different musical genres such as jungle, drum and bass, grime, trap, etc. But what's interesting about um De Forest's kind of commission and kind of uh approach to the eclipse as a site is that he wanted to kind of challenge this conventional this kind of established narrative that Reynolds posits and he wanted to kind of uh, reinterpret it through a sonic fiction or through an afrofuturistic lens borrowing various different kind of um methods that are kind of being put forward by Echo Eschen uh and other practitioners or black quantum futurism for example as well so he wanted to kind of distort or question the temporal kind of aspects of uh the music but also question but also investigate the kind of rhythms that were kind of prevalent too so you know the initial output which was developed over a prolonged period of time it was over kind of probably 12 to 16 months uh was that the, the work was developed was that, you know, De Forest made this kind of um, audio essay, which is also quite similar, I guess, but, you know, far more lengthy to the Paul Purgus work. And, you know, it was an hour long and obviously, you know, um, it didn't really fit with the kind of the parameters of broadcast or with um, making... Uh, sounds accessible in a site-specific context now would have been too long for people to engage with it. But also it wasn't accessible via the the website that I'd constructed as well, which, you know, is the kind of source or the hub for these sound works. Um, so what DeForest did, which is, you know, key to this, this work, is that he um, refined a piece by a series of editing, splicing and layering of sounds that were then kind of intrinsic to the frequencies that were recorded at that space via um, field recordings. So the frequencies were kind of basically shaped or the music or the sounds that the material that he had was shaped to those specific frequencies. And in doing so, by kind of cutting something that was 60 minutes long to 15 minutes, he layered these different kind of um, sounds to create uh, what we refer to as a sonic palimpsest, which is, you know, similar to how the palimpsest is used within architectural terms or literary terms, where it's about this kind of erasure, but it's not it's not fully erased. It's, there's still some kind of um, residue that kind of uh, coexists with the kind of contemporary. So it's just kind of almost the past is all present in the future, but everyone seems to have forgotten the past to paraphrase um mark fisher so um with that you know as his kind of um his practice uh, as a musician and a drummer what um de forest did was he kind of then applied live drumming on top of this dub which he referred to as the dub the kind of audio i say the laser the layering and with the ambition to try and transport the lister through these kind of different set of frequencies and rhythms into a different temporal space and into a different context as well. So, and in doing so, he wanted to kind of challenge, you know, um, the uh, the various, you know, kind of um, propositions that are put forward by Simon Reynolds. So this work uh, has been quite an extensive program and at each of the sites um they are identifiable 
with these fly posters, which um, was again a kind of reference point to, I guess, music culture, DIY music culture, rave culture, but also to um, the critical practices of artist collectives such as Group Material, who um, you know did a number of kind of posters within New York when, when during the late eighties, and also the 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 design of the posters, the font, for example. Um, mirrored that of art and language, which was um, the, the aforementioned um, art collective, which performed conceptual art collective, which performed at the top of Cox Street. So the QR code here is the way it was designed for basically, you know, uh, mainstream audiences to access this piece of history, the sonic, these sonic works, these sound works, as a form of engagement and to kind of reinterpret these spaces. So, you know, you can use your mobile phone, place it up against, and then you will be uh, transferred to the website. And, you know, it's interestingly, you know, the idea for that really came about because the research kind of began during the period of um, COVID. And, you know, um, the British the, the British Chancellor, who's now the Prime Minister at the, moment, at the time, came up with this really great idea called um, Eat Out to, I can't remember now, Eat Out to something, anyway. But it was, a, it was, it was the idea was to generate income within the kind of hospitality industry, but uh, which you did do uh, at the taxpayer's expense, but it also generated um, a proliferation of uh, increasing kind of COVID cases by a third or something like that. So basically, if you were to go to Cog Street now in Coventry, you know, um, you will find these posters in very particular places, and then you can access this sound work. But on top of that as well, um, you know, there's a local radio station that I'm working with called Hills FM. The uh, program will be broadcast there, the sound works alongside field recordings, and then and kind of excerpts from various different interviews. And then it'll also be published via the Camden Arts Centre as well, and also uh, NTS Radio. So the idea is there is to kind of try and disseminate and distribute um, in the same way that you I distribute music, I guess, or various different podcasts, you know, in, in using those different methods of distribution. And the top, uh, on top of that, you know, I'll also be um, presenting with cassette tapes. And there's both a conceptual and a distribution uh, necessity with that, um, because the South Asian community would often use um, oral histories, would record oral histories, and send the tapes back to their families wherever they, you know, wherever they, they particularly come from. But also the rave culture at the Eclipse, um, that was the first um, organization to kind of basically record DJs and then distribute tapes of DJs. So there's this kind of duality there of kind of purpose. So um concurrent with the uh with the um with this research program I started to work as the public programs curator at Camden Arts Centre, which had historically been focused solely on exhibitions. And so basically drawing on my extensive experience um, from the ICA and also my research practice and various independent projects that I kind of delivered, such as novel, which I'll speak about later. Um, I, uh, I kind of actively introduced an interdisciplinary events, uh, a series of interdisciplinary events with a focus on the sonic, literally, and so socially driven audience engagement practices. And the the first output of my uh, kind of tenure there was uh, public knowledge, and public knowledge, the title and the kind of, I guess the the kind of methodology, was informed by Michael Asher, uh, and Michael Asher was an educator and an artist practitioner who's um, deeply associated with the institutional critique. Um, and taught at Cal Arts for a number of years, and you know, taught artists such as um, like Kelly, uh, I think Christopher Williams, and other kind of like uh, neo conceptualist practitioners. Um, but what led me to um, to Luke uh, and to this kind of 
idea of what public knowledge could be, which was basically uh, a program that would kind of aim to dismantle kind of establish hierarchies in public programming and create a space for knowledge exchange um, and also kind of promote new publishing practices. And what Luke has done, I mean, he's done a, you know, which actually got a big write up in the New York Times, I remember. So, for example, he did a project around um, uh, rave adverts. So on illegal pirate stations, they would advertise um, different illegal raves or where you could buy the tickets for raves and things like that on these pirate radios. So again, it was a kind of formation of new communities or a point of distribution for communities to engage and interact. For this uh, event that I did, it was basically... It was, you know, it, it, it was just before, um, you know, the kind of global anxiety around COVID and the pandemic. So it was the first time I had to kind of, the opportunity I had to kind of test this this kind of model. And so it's, you know, I, I kind of placed it in a very kind of convivial space, almost in a bar, you know, the cafe bar kind of re 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 reframed how it kind of looked. And then we just kind of play different kind of sound system videos and um, and discussed their kind of pertinence or relevance within the UK. You know, you had different sound system cultures that were kind of geographically different or had a different kind of uh, aims and ambitions. So we're thinking about these kind of recordings as basically social social documents and how they kind of form different sonic publics and how these different sonic publics would congregate around these different sounds. So that was the kind of first of the um, public knowledge, oh, something's amiss, oh, here you go, the public knowledge uh, programming. And then, of course, you know, I've tried to kind of give an example of every year because, you know, the problem that I have is sometimes I'm too prolific and uh, work beyond the hours that you're kind of often ascribed to. So this was another project that I did with an artist called um, uh, Adam Harrison, who went by the name of a studio for propositional cinema. And this was kind of a program which we, you know, designed intentionally to kind of exist for a kind of period of time across the winter when, you know, museums or galleries are traditionally closed. And it's a very long durational video and features works by Roy Arden, Karen Sitter, Irena Heddock, Lucy Mayer, all the artists that you can see there. Uh, but the kind of a, a key uh, like connection again with Camden Art Centre and kind of trying to, you know, these kind of, how do you fix these kind of uh, remote kind of programmes um, with the site of, you know, whether being produced was David Lamellas, who made a film that kind of documented the workings of Camden Arts Centre as a public arts or civic space uh, in the 60s. Um, and that, that work is kind of rarely seen and shown, and that's now, you know, um, it's an interesting document of an artist documenting how you know, I guess a precursor in some ways to institutional critique, but it's just a kind of, but I think it's less in, intended or intentional in its kind of um, uh, kind of analysis of, of the art organisation. But again, it's, you know, it's it's something that is, you know, deeply interesting for the viewer. And actually, it's, it's still on, online now. So if you did want to have a look at it. So this is, you know, this period of programming you know, as, a, as I said, was, I guess, perceived initially as a challenge because you're not having any direct engagement with audiences. But what it did enable was um, a wider ambition of what you could achieve with online programming. And, you know, the 87 Press here, which is an independent press um, in the UK, which has published books by Kasper Heinemann and Dan Singh Bra and other kind of, you know, really interesting writers and artist writers that are kind of, uh, I feel are really incredibly relevant today. But what this offered was also an opportunity for 
to extend the discussion beyond, you know, traditional formats of an hour or an hour and a half. So, you know, if you were to log on to the website, Canada Arts Centre website, and type in this, there's a long form essay there written by um, the 87 Press, uh, Asad Sharma and uh, Kashi Patel. And, you know, and then also a series of kind of different kind of pieces of poetry with the aim to kind of basically, it's a three-part series that discusses uh, ideas around cross-cultural anti-racist activism, critical theory, and also how this impacts future publishing in the UK. So I'm just conscious of time here. So, you know, this this is this I thought was a kind of a positive opportunity, as was um the opportunity to work with DeForest Brown Jr. and Steve Code and the Kissy, and also then partner up with um House uh, Hakova in or HKW at Primary Information, one being in Berlin, the other one being in New York. And you know, this this um these opportunities were developed with this kind of need to maintain cultural output, I guess, but also to kind of um delve into kind of deeper discussions around you know historical context, but also on this occasion, the Forrest Brown Jr.'s book, which sought to re-examine Techno's origins, which is an extension of his Make Techno Black Again pro project. And it's transat transatlantic journey, basically it's kind of reverse migration to Europe and then how it's been uh, arguably co-opted and then kind of um, by kind of consumer or kind of tourist kind of ideals, particularly with Berlin. This was the idea with partnering with uh, HKW in Berlin because, you know, obviously Techno, Berghain, all these different kind of cultural centres that are prevalent to younger communities or, you know, or myself, you know, um, basically kind of almost consumed Detroit techno and then kind of created a new version, which was far more uh, kind of, I guess, technology driven and also more kind of, a, you know, kind of routine in, in its kind of rhythmic construction. Um, so this was, yeah, this was another kind of project. And then thankfully, you know, with the ease and the COVID restrictions, um, I felt it was important to kind of reunite people for live shared experiences. That was a priority for me. And I, ha I haven't got time to go into, you know, other facets of programming that I do, such as Garden Nights, which exists for a kind of seasonal period, which is kind of live musical or film um, within the kind of outdoors. Um, but it also enabled me to basically put on an event called Quantum Listening uh, with Ignota Books, which was led by Vivian Griffin, who, also contributed to uh, the earlier research project, We Versions, alongside DeForest Brown Jr. So what was important about quantum futurism, uh, sorry, quantum listening, is that it, um, it emphasized listening as a form of activism. And it was based on the manifesto by Pauline Olivieros. And I guess what I wanted to do there was kind of maintain this investment or kind of participatory element with the audience where there's this kind of deeper engagement with the content that, you know, we are producing on behalf of Canada Arts Centre, but trying to maintain these discussions and actually think about them in a kind of more in-depth kind of political, social, but also century kind of methodology. So quantum listening um, is was proposed or an extension of deep listening, which was um, as mentioned a kind of uh, manifesto by Pauline Olivieros. And it was aimed at kind of reshaping society, uh, fostering emotional relationships and peace as, uh, as a kind of uh, ideology, as a global ideology. So, you know, that's basically me almost formalizing, giving myself 10 minutes just to talk about novel, but I just wanted to kind of touch on this forthcoming event. So I can't really talk about it because it's coming, it's happening in you know imminently on saturday but what i wanted to the reason why i wanted to share this is because again it's around innovative forms of programming it's led by a researcher and practitioner a graphic design practitioner called paul bailey and it's around ideas of the visual essay uh, and he describes it not only as a noun but as a verb so where essaying becomes an event and a social platform collective thought which you know um 
which I guess is something that I didn't have the kind of terminology or the tools to kind of uh, apply to my own kind of programming, but it feels deeply relevant to how I speak to kind of um, within public programs, think about temporality, think about materiality, complexity of language and the contingent circumstances or spaces that we inhabit and how we use those spaces as, um, I guess, convivial collaborative spaces for, for programming. So a key aspect of my curatorial practice and uh, certainly with public programming and exhibition making has always been in uh, the ideas of collaboration. So that leaves me 10 minutes to talk about um, the a project called Novel, which on the website, it gives you the kind of extensive text about what Novel was trying to achieve. But Novel is an interesting, um, it came about a kind of interesting set of circumstances where Alan and I uh, first collaborated when I was running an artist run space with the artist Antia Hamilton. Um, and he did a show, um, curated a show there called uh, We All Love. And Alan and I um, get on and and we started collaborating from, I think, about 2008. Uh, and at that time, I was just finishing up my MA at the Curating Curatorial Royal College of Art Curating School. And, and basically, you know, we were invited, we did a show for uh, Vilma Gold Project Space in Berlin, and then that basically uh, was really well received. And it was at the time of the uh, masculinity journey of my son Men uh, Biennale that he did. And we were kind of almost doing a kind of parallel version of that, or a parallel interpretation of modernism. And that's from the early journeys uh, of my son Men. I thought it was a very good Biennale, very good, very site specific, very kind of um you know engaged with the histories of berlin which is a particularly kind of um kind of difficult space historically you know for obvious reasons so we were invited by anna katrina gebbers um to present um to present a project there which is here and i go through it actually on the website here you go and you know, what, what happened there, there's the list of artists that uh, contributed. So what happened there was that the apartment was just next to Checkpoint Charlie, and it was um, Anna Katrina Gebbers is the curator of the Hamburger Barn off now. And she, uh, basically the spaces, you know, she wanted to do a project at the same time. And we basically thought, well, we won't really have the right type of space to develop the project that we wanted to develop, you know, in a kind of traditional exhibition making format. So what we did, um, we started to think about the site in a really kind of intrinsic way and think about, well, who would have lived in that property? Because it, the, the location of it suggested a uh, a kind of hierarchical position within, within, within the culture of, you know, the former East Germany. And so we basically went about kind of using a... Um, a model, a kind of writing model for uh, creative writing, where you kind of think about the protagonist and what, how do you make up that protagonist? What are these different kind of set of indicators or signals or signifiers to kind of um, suggest who that person might be? And that's where novel kind of evolved. So it's a publication. It's an exhibition as a publication. But it also was kind of uh, it, what it coexisted with was with a film programme, uh and also a collection of you know various works so here on the website you can see there's like a franz west chair rupert norfolk work there cheney thompson on the wall but we designed the well we didn't actually design the publication we asked um a designer called james langdon who's a very good designer actually and he, uh, we kind of basically said to him, "Here's the artist works. We, we, you know, we selected the different artists. We told them about the concept for the project, and then they, um, you know, which was basically we want to create a persona, and then they kind of shared certain works. So you know, and be it visual, be it you know, kind of uh, literary, 
And James put that together. But the idea was that we didn't want any staples or it to be bound. So it still existed almost like a pamphlet. And the, the idea of the pamphlet was to kind of return it back to this kind of ideas of artists' books or artists' works that kind of, you know, almost uh, going back all the way back to Hogarth or people like that, where it was a kind of um, a channel of income besides their main kind of practice as such. So that was a uh, novel. And, you know, I guess the manifesto line that we give there, if I wanted to paraphrase it, was that, you know, novel um, or artist writing, the, the platform of novel was to um, sit between fiction and critique and collate voices that kind of challenge traditional methods of representation, creation and the creation of subjectivity. So the, init uh, the initial position, the initiative positions language and fiction as materials not tethered to a singular theme, that the fiction acts as a speculative, speculative tool unfettered by its narrative or signifying aspects, but rather as a conduit for knowledge informed by theory, film, politics, and storytelling. And, you know, the idea of novels to encourage audiences to appreciate writing, not just as information transmission, but also as an autonomous cultural production liberated from the imperative to communicate. Now, here are the kind of list of different projects that we did, you know, so there was a presentation from the second one at Archive Cabinet. Um, and, you know, Alan has done this wonderful website here. This was Novel 3. And we were also invited to do projects. Uh, yeah, that was Dependence, Novel 3. So Dependence is a commercial gallery in Brussels. Um, we were invited to participate in a, in a project uh, called Time Again at the Sculpture Centre, where we kind of curated a space within an exhibition. And that featured works here, such as Ed Atkins, uh, Mark Kamir Shamovitz, Stephen Clayden, uh, that's the rear there, uh, Paul Tech, Rebecca Whiteman, Joseph Strau. Yeah, so it's very much of a particular kind of um, set of artists that were kind of practicing, practicing at the time. And Alongside that, within the catalogue, we presented works by Barry McGregor Johnson, Emmy Wardle, Mark Lecky, Charles Atlas, Joseph Strau, again, um, and Ed Atkins as well, again. So this was really, you know, we and then we ended up becoming a bit of a fixture within various different kind of um, survey presentations of artist publishing or curatorial publishing practices. And, I, you know, I've kind of benchmarked it here as between 2009 and 2018. But, you know, we've had a bit of a hiatus uh, just because, you know, I've been busy doing other projects, as has Alan. But one project that I did want to refer back to, which I guess was, again, really important, and I've got two minutes to quickly talk through this anyway. So it's a reproduction of May, a reproduction of Three Weeks in May 1970. And it was an interdisciplinary multi-venue program. And it was a year-long project. And it was inspired by a work by Rita Donner and the students who uh, she was teaching at that time at University of Reading. And they occupied a studio in Reading. And basically, it was a response to the Kent State Massacre. Um, and they basically kind of put aside all traditional teaching methods to develop a shared kind of space of knowledge exchange. Uh, which manifested in performances, discussions. And so their actions, um, you know, they wanted to express political imagery, um, which, you know, very much dealing with the politics of its time, uh, through various different kind of media, not just kind of physical, formal matter. And, you know, so Donna's painting reflection on Three Weeks of May became this kind of, um, this conduit, or the kernel of the kind of, uh, and, their, and then the subsequent teachings became this kind of kernel for a kind of year long project over different spaces with Patricia Boyd, Hannah Kamek, Rene Green, Studio for Propositional Cinema, and Stephen Warwick. And um, I guess I can quickly show what that looked like um, by going back onto the website. Here we go, I'm ready. 
And this is a work by Patricia Boyd, which is all about mapping. So we did it as a series of episodes. So the first episode was a billboard campaign, again, kind of uh, subconsciously referencing group material. Um, and then, uh, you know, film program, uh, then there was a screening, partially buried, which was episode two. And then actually, if any of you have watched uh, Fargo series five, this actor, Sam Sproul, he plays um, Ola Monk. He's a friend. He did a performance uh, by Studio Proposition from Cinema. Um, and then Patricia Boyd did an exhibition and Stephen Warwick did a performance as well. So I'm almost at the end of time. I can see this one thing in the chat. Um, and I hope I didn't rush through everything too much at the end there, Stephen. But I tried to do Perfect. my best. Perfect. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, so, yeah. Well, I was just going to say to people, um, as I wrote, um, if you've got a question or a comment from Matt, this is the time to put it in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And so, so for... we, yeah, since we have a moment, um, let me just, you know, talk about the, with you about the ambitions of novel. Um, because obviously, though you say you're doing other things, that feels like it's an ongoing way you're trying to um, expand the idea of exhibition um, into different forms of expressivity that cover, as is the case of your practice in general, cover other things we could say. So that's film, sound, uh, the, the notion of publication. Um, you know, I, I thought it was kind of interesting the way that you talk about writing as an autonomous um, expression. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to do with um, rationality even, which is something we were talking about before the um, the presentation. Um, maybe that's something for a moment since we have a moment and I'm not seeing anybody asking anything. Um, for you to talk a little bit about literary form as curatorial, within curatorial practice. Yeah, so it's something that, you know, I think novel, you know, I mean, I guess I, you know, I come from an art practice originally. And I always had this, um, I could never quite, you know, I was always frustrated with how I could find a way to kind of uh, communicate the uh, the kind of, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to make work that was both visually uh, engaging, but also had a kind of text or a kind of narrative or, you know, kind of conceptual kind of premise. I could never find this kind of medium um, that kind of justified both ambitions. So I kind of would often get frustrated with those kind of restrictions. So I guess that's where I kind of naturally started falling into curation as a form of practice, as a creative practice. And then thinking about these different kind of constructs of what curating can be, you know, and... You know, I, I probably didn't even really know what curation was when I first encountered, you know, we were doing this artist-run space and it was just more about kind of create, trying to create a social space or, you know, it's very naive in its ambition and construction. But what came through, what I found myself doing and Antia that, I, you know, I did it with as well, is we got really, really excited about the invitation cards or the posters. And, you know, and about layout and design and things like that, you know, and of course, you know, I, I was referencing Kippenberger and, you know, different Cologne, New York artists that would, you know, use text at that time, thinking about text as a kind of prompt for thought and thinking about it coming from these very kind of distinctive perspectives or positions or points of interpretation, subjectivities, basically. You know, but then at the same time, how do you make a statement and maintain its value, but at the same time, for want of a better word, make a sexy image, make something that's attractive, that's aesthetically kind of engaging and pleasing. Um, you know, and I guess this is what we were talking about before was the, the kind of irrational leap of the artist. 
Um, and kind of, you know, so again, Alan is from an arts practice backdrop as well, although, you know, he's, he's a professor uh, at Reading University. But, you know, he, you know, I guess it's about trying to find these constructs or these spaces where both can inhabit without being overly formally justified or kind of, um, you know, without falling into too many dogmatic traps of what, you know, culture is or what, you know, what art is or how you encounter that, you know. And this is where I think novel became this really kind of fluid platform for us to kind of build communities around the publication and then those communities would then also be evidenced within whether it be launches or events or book fairs and things like that. So it created this kind of, you know, it became in itself a kind of point of distribution. Mm. And, you know, and then as projects evolved, as invitations, you know, but we'd always return back to a kind of literary reference. Uh, and that would be, you know, we're well with exhibition making, certainly. You know, so we did a couple of projects in Venice. Um, one being Exercises in Style, which isn't on there, actually, on the website, and the other one being uh, in the Reading Room of Hell. But, you know, they were coming, you know, and again, it's, it's about thinking about these artists and that writing or that language kind of coalescing around an idea and how... Again, that idea, however irrational it might be, or kind of not feel pertinent to that artist's practice, there's a kind of there's a hook or a ligature somewhere where you can hang these works off. So again, I think it's about trying to think about, I guess, exhibition making or you know curating uh, as a form of grammar, and thinking about those coherence, those kind of, you know, you know, it can be anti-grammar. You know, it can be incoherent. So that incoherence is a, is a kind of aesthetic or a stylistic approach in its own right. So you know, future projects. You know, I'm, you know, I want to reconnect. You know, both Alan and I in discussion again about doing new projects. But again, I think you know we're really interested in the idea of the sonic as well in relation to language and how language is published or performed. So yeah, hmm. does that answer? I'll probably yeah. Come. Well, yeah. I, um. I'm going to ask one more time if anybody has a a question or a comment, and we'll give it a moment. And then, if not, I I actually want to pick up with that notion of um, curating as a form of grammar, but also art, of course, as as a expressive means, which is a series of ciphers of signifiers and signifieds, and how how that breaks between what the artwork is and what the curatorial approach is. I think that's worth picking up. Um, so with that, I think what we're going to do, Matt, is thank you for the public presentation. And um, let's uh, conclude. And I will see you on the other link with the students. Brilliant. Great. And thank you, everyone, for all listening. And uh, thank you again, Stephen, for the opportunity. Absolutely. See you in a moment. Brilliant. Bye-bye.